This video is brought to you by Guardio. Stick around to hear more about the special offer they're providing to the entire upper echelon community. Everyone watching this at one point or another in their lives has heard the words atomic bomb, and they likely also know the story of its birth. The name conjures up images of destruction on kind of a frankly unimaginable scale, and was originally made possible by the discovery of nuclear fission. Otto Hahn, in his Berlin laboratory in 1938, was first to open the door to an entirely new dimension of conflict, which would later be refined and perfected by the United States in a secret initiative we now know as the Manhattan Project. This operation would ultimately change the fate of the entire planet. The atomic bomb would later be used to end the Second World War, become the basis of further global tension in the midst of the Cold War, and will persist likely forever as both an incredible gift of powerful advancement for the human race, as well as a danger to the future of the species. Everyone understands the gravity of those words, you know? Atomic bomb. But very few people understand the similar weight behind the term cyber weapon. Asking someone how they feel about nuclear conflict will essentially result in universally negative responses. It should not happen. A sense of fear. But asking someone how they feel about cyber weapons can yield an entirely different result. Mostly what you get are blank stares. People just don't know. Is it bad? Is it good? Are we winning? And most commonly, but how does it affect me? Most people online fail to realize the true implications of cyber weaponry, so today I want to take a look back at the world's first ever recorded cyber weapon and the story of how it was used. It begins with an article by John Bumgarner, a former US intelligence officer, posted to an information warfare journal in 2010. In it, he discusses how centrifuges used to refine nuclear fuel could be sabotaged or destroyed with the right type of cyber weapon. And that's precisely what happened. Timeline estimates are extremely blurry here. All parties involved to this very day attempt to remain as far distant from these events as possible, like a digital Chernobyl of sorts, but the cyber weapon that John Bumgarner had warned about was already real. Now referred to as Stuxnet, which is a moniker derived from a combination of keywords found in the software itself, the only reason this particular cyber weapon was ever discovered is because it leaked out into the open. At the time, no one seemed to know who was responsible, but the weapon had apparently been deployed against Iranian nuclear power infrastructure, only to then spread past that target when a programming error caused it to infect an engineer's laptop, which would later introduce it to the World Wide Web when the engineer returned home, connecting to his actual network. Stuxnet, as it was called, had been used with devastating impact as far back as 2007 in a protracted campaign to set back Iran's nuclear capabilities, but it was also very carefully crafted. Little damage would or even really could take place outside of a selective target scope. This was a four-part zero-day exploit, meaning that four separate previously unknown attack vectors were used in conjunction with one another to infiltrate and manipulate Windows operating systems. And when given access to very specific nuclear enrichment centrifuges on a particular model of a particular type, it varied their rotation speeds to the point of catastrophic failure. In short, it destroyed critical safety hardware in nuclear facilities while masking its own behavior from technicians and disabling diagnostic warning signs. Overall, a very powerful and extremely targeted cyber weapon. According to Michael Joseph Gross, Vanity Fair 2011, quote, in terms of functionality, this was the largest piece of malicious software that most researchers had ever seen, and orders of magnitude more complex in structure. Malware's previous heavyweight champion, the Conficker Worm, was only 1 20th the size of this new threat." End quote. For context, John Bumgarner, the man who had warned of Stuxnet prior to its most devastating application in 2010 and been correct about it, later claimed to have linked the Conficker Worm to Stuxnet as well. Conficker was apparently a door kicker and also one of the most virulent strains of malware ever discovered, which he claims was a separate component of the Stuxnet attack. All right, before I continue, it's time to discuss the video sponsor, which is Guardio. Something I feel compelled to say here, I actually work with and promote Guardio now on my own, independent from their sponsorship of the channel. I thought people should know that. I've looked into their company, found multiple separate instances where the research they provide or threat prevention they have is superior to market competitors. And overall, I recommend this product from a position where I actually use it myself and stand by the recommendation. Internet browsers are simultaneously incredible yet terrifying. Browsers will often store banking information, personal details, login credentials, and much more. This is done for convenience, but convenience also has a very distinctive price. Guardio, unlike many traditional threat response options, works proactively to detect threats before they ever reach your browser. Nowadays, a great deal of us will use the same computer for pretty much everything. Work, personal activities, you name it, it happens, but with that general purpose mindset comes dramatically increased risk. One wrong click can take down an entire business wipe out a crypto portfolio worth tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars even, or result in the loss of all your social media accounts. The programs that do that, by the way, are called stealers. They're nasty little programs. Guardio is here to help with that. 
When using Guardio, you'll be given information on all different types of browser threats and even be warned about current up-to-date phishing scams in real time. Guardio also offers a host of additional services from download protection to data breach alerts and will help protect you and your browser from roughly 10 times more online threats than current competitors. If you click the link down below right now, you can get a seven day free trial of Guardio services. Again, link down below in the description to support the channel and get a seven day free trial on one of the best threat prevention browser extensions for Chrome that I've ever found on the market. Big thank you to Guardio for sponsoring the channel. At first, credit and acknowledgement of the Stuxnet weapon remained relatively low. Theories were everywhere about who was responsible or why, most of them pointing back to the United States and Israel. More specifically, a special division of Israel's military intelligence directorate called Unit 8200. But nothing was certain. However, as time went on, clues became more common. Reported by the New York Times, a joint American-Israeli initiative called Operation Olympic Games had been devised under the Bush administration, later accelerated under Obama, which had been directly responsible for production and deployment of the Stuxnet weapon. Going deeper, submitted to UK Parliament, more specifically the Joint Select Committee on National Security Strategy, who had launched an inquiry at the time, Dr. Tara McCormick wrote, quote, America and Israel, with help from British Secret Services, devised a highly complex computer worm which damaged centrifuges in the Iranian nuclear facility of Natanz. This was a computer virus of such complexity that it had spread across the globe and took cybersecurity experts months to even begin to identify. It was part of a broader operation called Operation Nitro Zeus, authorized by President Obama, which would take control of and shut down Iran's critical infrastructure in the event of the failure of nuclear talks. It is no longer science fiction, but science fact, that states now have the capacity to use digital technology to inflict damage equivalent to a conventional military attack on another state." End quote. Common perception began to solidify that the United States, Israel, and perhaps a few more of their allies had collaborated to produce a digital weapon that could destroy nuclear facilities from the inside out. But that's not all. This is where things get complicated. To this very day, here and now, neither the United States nor Israel has claimed credit. The attack would likely be considered an act of war for that matter, but with extensive reporting done by the New York Times and other publications in the aftermath, common perceptions seemed to indicate that Operation Olympic Games was all too real and that a coordinated effort by multiple nations had taken place in order to perform this attack. With the benefit of hindsight and more than a decade of records to draw from, today we can piece together a little bit more of the puzzle. In 2011, while memory of the attack remained fresh in everyone's mind, Gabi Ashkenazi, I'm probably not pronouncing that right, sorry about that, former commander-in-chief of the Israeli Defense Forces, under which Unit 8200 operates, allowed a video to be played during his final day in office to celebrate his entire career. That video contained a list of his greatest achievements while serving, one of which, reported by Israeli newspaper Haaretz at the time, was Stuxnet. Interestingly, that video, evidence of it, and reference to it has become nearly impossible to find online. The original source has been deleted, the Telegraph reporting that most further publications would subsequently reference has been deleted, and even prior versions of the articles have been pulled down from internet archives. Seemingly one solitary copy of the newspaper remains, translated here on screen. Two years later, General James Cartwright, a reportedly crucial figure in Operation Olympic Games, who was, at the time, the person responsible for delivering the news physically to then-President Barack Obama and Vice President, now actual President Joe Biden, that the Stuxnet weapon had broken containment and made its way onto the World Wide Web, basically the man who had to tell the president that the cyber weapon got loose, became the target of a Justice Department investigation. The investigation centered on leaked classified intelligence with regards to Stuxnet, and three years later, James Cartwright pled guilty to making false statements in connection with the unauthorized disclosure of classified information. The United States and Israel have not formally acknowledged their hand in the deployment, development, or application of the world's first cyber weapon, but for those paying attention, they sort of did. In 2019, it was further revealed that one attack vector used to deploy Stuxnet had been a source cultivated by Dutch intelligence, AIVD, the Dutch intelligence service responsible, at the behest of the CIA and Mossad, had tasked this mole with delivering a USB stick infected with the Stuxnet cyber weapon into the nuclear facilities network, while posing as a mechanic doing work at the plant through a front company. Previously, according to research from cyber defense firm Symantec, the reported infiltration method had been a multi-pronged gateway attack that struck five intermediary targets beforehand. 
These intermediaries were industrial automation companies in Iran, which had been targeted so that the program might spread into the nuclear facility, which was tightly controlled and air-gapped, a process that simply means disconnecting the entire network from the broader internet. For all its complexity, Stuxnet ultimately succeeded in one simple goal, inflict damage upon Iran's capability to pursue nuclear technology, and whether or not various estimates are accurate, some claiming that the program set back the country's nuclear aspirations by multiple years or more, one thing is abundantly clear. The cost of using these weapons, much like the atomic bomb itself for that matter, must be weighed very carefully. Stuxnet is the first known instance of a global cyber weapon. It has become the foundation for multiple separate malware families in the aftermath, impacting modern end users on a daily basis because it was leaked into the wild, and it's even made its way to Hollywood. Anyone who wants to can go watch a film called Black Hat right now if they're interested, which is effectively a dramatization inspired by the impact that Stuxnet was able to have. It demonstrated in no uncertain terms that a simple string of computer code can do enormous damage to the critical infrastructure of an entire country and can persist undetected while doing so for years. Parallels to the atomic bomb here are kind of fascinating. First, each of these weapons were initially developed out of fear that some other nation would advance faster and threaten the United States. Second, the consequences of deployment in both cases were not fully understood before use. Stuxnet may have had the desired effect in the short term, but it also broke containment and became available to the world with untold consequences in the long term. Third, this new form of weaponry has been pursued just as aggressively, if not more so, when compared to nuclear technology over the past 10 to 15 years at least. And lastly, experts have been warning as loudly as they can against reckless usage of these weapons by political and military leaders, with very little effect. It's one thing to have a visceral display of an actual bomb. The impact there is kind of undeniable. But imagine the entire financial sector, or electric grid, coming down for even just a couple of days. On CBS 60 Minutes, more than a decade ago, former CIA director and prior head of the NSA, Michael Hayden, in the aftermath of Stuxnet, said, quote, We have entered into a new phase of conflict in which we use a cyber weapon to create physical destruction, and in this case, physical destruction in someone else's critical infrastructure, end quote. Everyone has heard the words atomic bomb, and they know exactly how serious it can be. But the words cyber weapon are just as impactful. The only difference here is public perception and general knowledge. People are scared of the wrong things. In a 2016 speech at Hiroshima, now former United States President Barack Obama said the following, quote, Mere words cannot give voice to such suffering. We have a shared responsibility to look directly into the eye of history and ask what we must do differently to curb such suffering again." End quote. This is ironic, considering the fact that the Obama administration accelerated a program to cause physical damage with digital tools, and that decision has had consequences. Normalization of reckless advancement in digital weaponry isn't as flashy as a missile crisis. It doesn't attract mainstream attention, and it's easy to overlook the similarity. But looking back at history, as President Obama ironically stated, shows us that we are, once again, emboldened in a pursuit of holding the bigger, heavier stick, in what amounts to a new frontier of war. Philosophically right or wrong, that's up to the individual. Stuxnet was the first known usage of a cyber weapon, and it leaked out into the wild. It was developed under an operation called Olympic Games, beneath an umbrella allegedly known as Nitro Zeus, where the US examined the prospect of digitally undermining critical infrastructure of an entire nation. It doesn't have the same conceptual impact as the words atomic bomb or Manhattan project, but it certainly, certainly has the potential to be just as dangerous. That's it. Hopefully you found this video entertaining. Please do consider checking out the links down below. Lots of different ways to support the channel. Also the video sponsor, of course, they're one of the main ones for the channel now, but I'll cut it there and stop rambling. As always, thank you all for watching and have a nice night.